It's great to be here. Thank you. Um, and what a perfect day it was outside. I wish we could all be out there <laughs> still. So, um, you know, I, here's this word, perfect, this idea we've been considering all morning and through into the early part of the afternoon. Uh, you know, it was really hard. It was a wonderful thing to be invited to come here to speak. But it was very challenging for me because basically for the last 30 years, my journalistic life has been spent exploring things that are highly imperfect. One example being the human relationship with the climate system, which of course, you know, it's complicated. The climate system used to do stuff to us and we would react or respond or die or get out of the way. And now it's a two-way relationship. So it's you know, taken us time to figure that out. I grant us that. Um, but it's hard. It's hard to be talking always about stuff that's highly imperfect. Another example came just today. I was sitting out in that beautiful glade there by the uh, waterfall with Yume Wang, who's the geohazards uh, official for the state of Oregon. And I've referred to her many times in my blog and in the printed paper um, in 2008 after the Sichuan earthquake in China because her job is to prevent calamity here in the state of Oregon from the inevitable great earthquake that will come offshore from that Cascadia fault that lies out there that only was found by science 25 years or so ago. A lot of the structures here were built a long time before that. So what do you do? That's a highly imperfect situation. And, and so that's, that's on my mind. I'll be blogging about that sometime in the next day or so. Tonight, tonight I'll be writing about the new uh, IPCC report uh, that's coming out in Berlin uh, overnight. Um, so that's my life. So perfect. So, so anyway, I, I kind of dug in for a long, through, the, through my course of my career, I, I kind of looked back and thought a lot about my life also, not just my journalistic life. And I came to this conclusion, <laughs> believe it or not, that for this consequential, complicated century, with all the turbulence and unpredictability among the things that we know, that, that we really are perfect. We're perfectly suited in all of our variegation and all the, the, the things you saw on display here today. You know, we have a dark side and a downside, but we have so much potential. So what I'm going to do is briefly take you through my reasoning for why I think this. And of course, when I say we are perfect, I'm absolutely putting an asterisk on that. <laughs> and, and, and you'll see in a little while what I mean by that. There's work to be done. In other words, we're not just, we don't get out of bed perfect, believe me. We've got stuff to do. So, but I'm going to start my argument by going back in time, 46 years. I can't believe it's that long since I was 12 years old. So uh, in 1968, I was growing up in Rhode Island in suburbia. Any Rhode Islanders? There must be at least one. Cool, all right. <laughs> so for me, you know, from my vantage point as a 12-year-old boy, living in a house, like a three-bedroom colonial house, I could go out the back door, through our yard, through a little patch of woods across a field, and then be on the edge of a tiny river, the Hunt River. And it, it ran behind a supermarket where I ended up being employed later uh, as a, the kind of grocery guy. So, so it was, you know, imperfect. But it was, for me, it was a great refuge. It was like a green mossy bank. I could go fishing. As you see, I like fishing. That's me with the glasses, so, with my brother. Uh, but at the same time, 1968, man, was about as imperfect a year as we've ever had. I mean, we've had many, you know, we had Vietnam. We had uh, two, two horrific assassinations. We had duck and cover exercises still in school. You know, the Cold War was raging. And uh, the population bomb was the big, the big hit book of the year. <laughs> Yay, population bomb. Paul Ehrlich's uh, Malthusian projections, most of which happily have not come to true. But we were, we were kind of stuck in the, this is before there were memes. You know, meme is like, <laughs> so 21st century. But, but woe is me was definitely uh, a theme that I grew up with, uh, especially in dealing with environmental questions. And the other one was, was this one, shame on you. So woe is me, shame on you, woe is me, shame on you. Those kind of, if you think about any environmental issue we were dealing with through the 60s, 70s, 80s onward, right now, to now, you think about those kinds of things. You know, Keystone, shame on somebody. Uh, George Bush, when I covered him in the White House, you know, was blocking action on global warming, shame on them. But it's not so simple now, it's not so simple now. But back then it was still simple. In 60, so 1968, 12 years old, one day I went out the back door through the woods to get to that field to go to the river and there was a bulldozer. I, this is not a picture I took of that bulldozer, this is another bulldozer. I wasn't that kind of present. But, but <laughs> whoa, I didn't post it on Facebook. <laughs> But, but so there was a bulldozer in my woods. Now, of course, they weren't my woods. They actually were a piece of property that someone else owned. And someone else was going to make it into a development, just like the one I was living in. You know, I wasn't conscious enough at the age of 12 to realize that there was a bulldozer that created the place where I was living also just a few years earlier. But to me, I was just righteously pissed off. I ran back to the house. I grabbed a red pen and a piece of paper, and I wrote a death threat. 
it was, you know, it was like a 12-year-old version of a death threat, sort of, whoever defiles these woods shall die in horrible flames or something like that. And I stuck it, I stuck it on the seat of the bulldozer. So that was my first activism, environmental activism <laughs> moment. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I kind of regret it, you know, looking back, because I don't know, the driver might have been actually freaked out. <laughs> so, but shame on you, both of these, these themes t stuck with me as I migrated from a biology degree into journalism, and especially environmental journalism. So by 1983, I was a magazine writer. 1983, get that? 83, ah, so old. <laughs> How many years ago is that? So, so my first article, my first big magazine article was, was a, like a classic of the genre, and it had, it had bad people, it had bad guys. It was a real shame on you kind of thing. Um, Paraquat was an incredible tool. It, it, it is still. It's a class of chemicals. It's herbicides that you can spray on a field, and you don't have to plow it. Then you can just, it kills the weeds, you plant your crop, they, it grows, and you don't have erosion. So it's like a revolution for agriculture. It still is. It's allowed a lot of avoided erosion. It's, it's, it doesn't persist like DDT or stuff like that. It goes away. But it happens to be really poisonous, like if you drank it or if it got on your skin. And so I was doing this reporting. Uh, and I found out that several thousand people around the world each, each year were being poisoned by this stuff. And in those days, it was literally phoning the Minister of Health in Thailand. There was no internet and all that stuff. So it was a lot of work. But at the same time, it wasn't a lot of work. I mean, this was, this was a picture from the brochure of the company. It's a picture of a guy with bare legs and bare feet spraying the pesticide on his legs. <laughs> and this was in their own brochure. So some of this wasn't so hard. You know, investigative journalism tends to be hard, but not always. The bottom, the, the bottom line is, you know, I, it's part of journalism to do all that finger pointing. That's our job, and, and it is still a vital part of what we need to do in the 21st century as well. But with issues that we face now, it gets a lot more complicated in a hurry, and I'll get to that in a minute. But just to give you a reprise on my career, so I started focusing on climate in uh, the mid-'80s, and the first story I did was on nuclear winter. This is the inverse of global warming, that if we, had, if we burn enough cities in a nuclear war, we, lo and behold, not only would that be a catastrophe, but we would cool the climate in ways that would be a catastrophe as well. A lot of woe is me, a lot, and certainly a lot of shame on you during the, the Cold War. And then uh, 1988 was my first story, my big, first big article on global warming. And from then forward, through more than 1,000 pieces, and I think it's close to 2,000 articles or blog posts on some aspect of climate change or the energy solutions we need. You know, it was all, again, it had those memes. Um, but then I had this epiphany, and it came in the mid-2000s when the whole argument over global warming became kind of a shouting match between people yelling alarmist and people yelling denier. And I started to look into this whole new body of work. Here I'd spent 25 years. I kind of feel like, in a way, I wasted a lot of time. I spent all the first 20 years writing about global warming as if it was a biogeophysical problem out there in the world. You know, greenhouse gases, physics says they trap heat, that makes ice sheets melt, uh, changes sea levels, you know, it was all that kind of stuff. And it had this if, well, if we cut emissions, then blah, blah, blah. But then I started reporting about the climate in our heads. Like, what is it about the human being that makes this a hard problem? As with sitting on the grass with Yumei Wang, what is it about the big risk from an inevitable great earthquake that makes it the kind of problem we don't get our, he our heads around. And that, that work was really depressing. If you think standing on the sea ice at the North Pole, as I did in 2003, with its cracking and shifting on your feet, you know, that's kind of scary. But, but this stuff is really unnerving. And if you want to kind of have a sleepless night, go to, this is the one website to write down, <laughs> culturalcognition.net. It's uh, the work of uh, a guy at Yale named Dan Kahane, who'd be a good person to get here sometime. He, he, he does empirical studies that show that more information doesn't matter quite often, that more information, more science, more education actually further divides people on issues like global warming or things like vaccin vaccination. It doesn't unite us, that we don't all have that aha moment. So as a journalist, oh my god, I mean, if there's an OMG moment, it's a journalist spending 25 years of your life and getting to a point where you realize more journalism isn't going to change the world. That's kind of an OMG thing for me. And, and he, just to show you a little bit of the evidence, here's a little bit of evidence. So here's four guys, four white men, something about Nobel Prizes. <laughs> anyway, they all have Nobel Prizes in physics. And um, well, one Asian American man, but you get the idea. <laughs> they are, um, and they have completely divergent views of global warming. 
So here, they're the, among the smartest people on the planet. They really understand physics. And I did a whole post, you have to look for it online, to get the idea that more education makes people more divided about issues that, where you think that they that might simplify things. And just to give you another example, this gets to the point of me having my ONG moment about being a journalist. Here's two guys. I'm sure Bill McKibben has been through Portland many times. He's a good friend of mine. Long, he's a, a hero of the environmental movement. He believes after Fukushima happened, that horrible earthquake tsunami uh, devastated that nuclear power plant, he wrote a piece in The Guardian saying, oh my, this is a terrible moment. We have to, we have to um, get away from nuclear power uh, right away. It's too brittle. And George Monbiot, the other guy who, who's probably less familiar to you, he's a British environmentalist, similar track record to Bill, and he thought he's, he's a proponent of nuclear power. He said, Fukushima proved that you can have the most disastrous possible event at a, at a nuclear plant and not end up with a catastrophic release. That's why we need nuclear power more. So my, you know, again, it's more evidence that even if we solve the dispute over whether global warming is human driven, et cetera, that doesn't necessarily mean we're all gonna be touchy-feely and move forward on some unified plan. So when you, when you get to that point, when you get to this point, that leads you to feel like this guy. Uh, I took this picture at the, the Copenhagen climate talks in 2009, and it was the, at the end of the negotiations, some cameraman was just completely blotted, like we all were. And we all have felt that way in some way or other. But there's a, there, I do think, in reflecting on the same social science that I just described to you, in reflecting on the nature of our variegated species with edge pushers and, and group huggers and loners and libertarians and liberals, there is a way forward on the problems that are most consequential in this century. And it involves reconsidering how we, make, how we set our goals for the environment, for sustainability more generally. The, uh, we've done too many of our goals this way. They're kind of no numerical. We've got to get to 350. We don't really know how, but we're going to get to that number. Uh, two degrees. We're going to avoid a two degree threshold. 80% uh, by 2050, we're going to pledge to get there somehow. The problem with these kinds of goals is they've never been met. You look at, you know, back in 1992 when I wrote about the first climate treaty, it had all these pledges and we just kind of sailed right through. And that's because, as a guy named Jesse Osabel at Rockefeller University has said, uh, politicians are mostly pulling on disconnected levers. There's a lot of motion and, and every one, you know, once in a while a treaty gets signed. But most of that stuff is reflecting what's already possible. It's not shaping our, our situations or our, our decisions. The same thing goes for science. Science doesn't really, you, you can set these numbers, but whether we get there or not is not based on the numbers. So here's, here's the deal. I think if we shift from having traits that are like numbers toward shift from, I mean goals that are like numbers to, to goals that are, how do we, what traits would we want in a society that we think give us a best shot of getting toward those numbers, those ideals, limiting losses in a, in a disastrous earthquake? limiting uh, dangerous global warming. What would you see as that body, that body of traits? And I came up with a tweet last year that I thought kind of, it was a series of nine tweets, but it started with this one, where I said, strategy for sustainable human progress, bend, stretch, reach, teach, reveal, reflect, rejoice, repeat. And then I did a set of eight tweets that kind of build on that. So I'm gonna really quickly, hopefully quickly, so I stay on time, but I'm not, I'll try, I'll try, I'll really try. Bend is very simple. It's resilience, you know, that overused word, but we know what it is. The problem is, of course, building a resilient New York City in the face of rising sea levels can be done, it can be designed beautifully by architects and planners, but politicians still want to give speeches saying we will, we will not retreat. So that's where the work goes. How do you, can you build a politics that can allow this kind of softer New York City to evolve, which has to evolve in one way or another? Uh, stretch is what you've heard a lot of here today, the wonderful, innovative nature of human beings. Here's a guy, Ben Gulak at MIT. He was a, he was a freshman at MIT. He said, uh, he went to China, he saw pollution and traffic. He said, I'm gonna design a, an electric motorcycle, a single-wheeled electric motorcycle, and he did. I mean, he's a wizard at MIT. His grandfather was a metallurgist, he had a big shop. And now he's proceeding with that. And you know, nine billion people riding around on, on uh, electric motorcycles is not gonna solve the world's problems. But his spirit, his initiative, his ability to take an idea and concretize it is, is the thing I'm talking about. So maximizing that potential in, in people is great. Uh, reach is Yao Ming. And I don't mean just this NBA, retired NBA star's you know, amazing reach. I mean what he's done on Twitter and Weibo and uh, the other social media in China 
with both with shark fins and now with rhino horn and elephant ivory is remarkable. And he's done it in a, in a wide uh, um, an initiative harnessing the power of um, WildAid, which is wildaid.org, which is an international NGO working particularly in China to cut the flows of those um, products that are devastating uh, animal populations in some of the world's most troubled places. That's reach, getting out there, reaching. Uh, teach is not just about, you know, we all know education systems are in trouble, as you just heard a minute ago. There's so many ways to improve the system. One is to think about learning experiences that actually get kids thinking about how the real world works. A few years ago, my wife, who used to be a science teacher, she, she and her uh, co-teacher came up with a, a sort of a, a twist on the very familiar exercise, the bridge building and breaking thing, where kids would build balsa bridges and then put weights on them and compete to see whose bridge hold, held the, la the most weight. Well, they added a component where it was a cost-benefit thing. The kids had to buy their balsa wood with you know, play money, and then they were judged on, on price and performance, which is sort of like the real world. And the enthusiasm when this happens is amazing, and I'm sure you've seen something like it. Here we go. Now, now this, is not a, this is not a costly exercise. Balsa wood is cheap. And, and you saw that kid at the end, you know, yeah, it's great stuff. It's great stuff, but we have to facilitate having teachers having enough time to be able to build that in a curriculum, making sure it, it meshes with your standards. There's ways to do it, though. And, and working toward that is a great goal. Reveal is a word that I think is vitally important. Transparency is being posed on the world, whether we want to or not. Snowden, the Snowden effect on that scale. But here's an example, just changing the wavelength of light with which we look at an issue uh, can change things. This is a sun beautiful sunny day, like today, in Colorado. It's an oil tank, a storage tank for oil. And here's the same oil tank when you look at it with an um, infrared camera, which is not expensive. And what do you see that you didn't see in the last picture? Um, pollution just wafting steadily from that tank. It's methane, the, the important greenhouse gas, and a contributor to local air pollution. And it's there, but if you, you never notice it, if it wasn't, if, all you have to do is switch wavelength, and you can make your case uh, to, the, to the population there that they have a problem that they wouldn't have perceived otherwise. Reflect is science. You know, basically, science matters, and if we, we find it harder and harder with our Congress today to sustain the kind of uh, investments we need in basic science so that entrepreneurs have the, have the ideas that they can then play with and turn them into products. And, and also, this is the uh, important part, is keeping track of stuff, keeping track of stuff year by year. This is dams in America from 1800 on. Just watch for a second. That's the damming of all the streams and rivers in America. And you don't notice that, obviously, on a year-to-year, decade-to-decade basis. But you see, we've, the Anthropocene is this enormous changes underway finding ways to, to visualize those changes so that we can understand the, the, consequ the scope of our actions is really important. Rejoice is just getting outside like we just did at lunch and just remembering how special this place is that we live in, wh whatever place you live in. Uh, Thoreau talked about the, the value of the swamp at the edge of town. It's not just about the wild places in the world, which are great, but you can find those little nooks in a town or design them as you've done here with this waterfall. Get joy, <laughs> rejoicing. And also in our specialness, and in our variegation, and in our imperfection, and you know, embracing ourselves, what I call anthropophilia, which is a way through the Anthropocene, is really vital. Finally, there's the hardest thing of all, discipline, <laughs> repeating, saying, okay, we're not done. A quick example, and I'm almost out of time, but I've, I've kind of, well, just, okay. Really quick example, uh, in New Mexico, uh, BP had some uh, uh, facilities that were leaking methane, there was a guy in charge of keeping track of their leaks uh, from their gas fields. He kept going back. He went back there through, like, after a year or two, um, and, and they had cut their emissions 50%. Whoa, that was great. It was a great achievement. He said, why did you stop? Why did you stop? And in the end, because of that pressure, that culture of circling back, uh, they cut their emissions of methane from their gas facilities 99%. So it's like the idea, getting rid of the idea of best practices being some static set of rules of the game, as opposed to best practices being this whole idea of having a culture of never stopping, never looking back, never sitting on your laurels, understanding that, that we have great power to make the world a better place. So with that, I'll just close by repeating <laughs> that we are perfect with uh, a big asterisk. Thank you very much. <laughs>